Book Club. My name is Ana Lucia Araujo. I am professor of history at Howard University in Washington, D.C. And today we are here for another session of the Slavery Archive Book Club to discuss the book, The Story of Rufino. And this is a book by three Brazilian historians uh, who are Flávio dos Santos Gomes, João Reis, João José Reis, and Marcos de, de Carvalho. Uh, the Slave Archive Book Club is an initiative, independent initiative, and uh, along with me, I have uh, three other co-hosts, and they are Vanessa Holden. Vanessa, I don't know if you can say hello from where you are. <laughs> Let's see, Vanessa, if she can just show up. Vanessa Holden, who is uh, an assistant professor at University of Kentucky in the Department of History. Alex Hill, uh, who is uh, at Columbia University, who is also our co-host. And in addition to that, we have also Jessica Marie Johnson from John Hopkins University. Today, she is not with us, but uh, she is she is with us in spirit because you know that for this event to happen, we have to spend several weeks announcing, insisting for people to come, sending emails, uh, putting this on Instagram, on YouTube, on uh, Twitter and Facebook. Then uh, by now I would ask you that I know that some of you, you are perhaps uh, unmuted. Uh, if you can keep your um, uh, uh, then your mic uh, muted and unmute yourself only when you want to speak. Uh, if you want to speak, there are several ways of doing. You can always wave for us. You can also click on uh, participants uh, at the bottom of your screen and then you click to raise your hand and you are going to see that you have uh, a question. Those who are on YouTube, when you ask a question, if you have your video turned on, you are going to be able to see your face. And as this is being transmitted on YouTube, people will be able to see you as well. And I think that is important because you have so many nice people together here today and it's nice uh, to be able to see your faces. We are going to take your questions also on YouTube. Uh, then uh, first we are going to have the, the, the presentation by João Reis and then uh, you'll be able to ask your questions and uh, make comments. Before that, however, I just want to introduce our historians who are then the authors of the, this uh, great book that is a book that was originally published uh, in 2010 by Companhia das Letras that is one of the main publishers in Brazil. And uh, the book was then uh, translated uh, this year, was published just this year, then about uh, 10 years after it was published in Brazil. Uh, it was published then in English. And uh, the book is translated by Sabrina Gladhill, who is also, we have the pleasure to have her uh, among us today. Uh, daughter Gladhill, she is uh, then um, a PhD and she got her PhD from Universidade Federal da Bahia. Then she is also a scholar who works uh, with uh, these topics. Uh, she's currently based in the UK, but uh, daughter uh, Gladhill, she also uh, then um, okay, translated other works by uh, João José Reis that were published in English. Then let me just introduce uh, these three historians because uh, I have among us here then some uh, of uh, my students, uh, people who are based in the United States who don't know their works. And these three authors, they are amongst uh, the finest historians uh, of slavery in Brazil. Uh, then uh, Flávio dos Santos Gomes, he has a PhD in social history from Universidade uh, Estadual de Campinas. He's a full professor in the Department of History of Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, then Rio de Janeiro. And he is a collaborator professor in the program, in the, um, the graduate program at the University, Federal University of Bahia. He's also uh, he's a prolific historian who is author then of several books 
articles, uh, also uh, added uh, several books, then most of them uh, are um, in, uh, in Portuguese. In 2009, he got a Guggenheim Fellowship. Uh, then uh, in 2014, he was also a visiting professor at New York University. And last, last but not the least, he is a member of the executive board of the Association uh, for the Study of the World um, Wide African Diaspora. Then he is uh, a fellow member of this uh, committee and I am uh, happy that uh, he is. And most of his works are not uh, necessarily translated and this is one of the um, the few works that is uh, translated into English. Now, João José Reis. João José Reis is a full professor in the Department of History at Universidade Federal uh, da Bahia. Uh, he was a visiting professor in the United States in several different universities here, uh, University of Michigan, Brandeis, Princeton, University of Texas at Austin, uh, and Harvard as well. And his books uh, and his work received then several prizes, including the honorary foreign member of the American Historical Association, Machado de Assis Prize of the uh, Brazilian uh, Academy of Letters. And he is author, of course, of several books that are very important in the study of uh, slavery in the 19th century Brazil, and of course, with connections with Africa and so on. And several of these books are indeed uh, translated into English. Uh, the Perhaps the most important book and one of the first that was published in English is Slave Rebellion in Brazil, the Muslim Uprising of 1835 in Bahia. Uh, also, Divining Slavery and Freedom, Death is a Fast festival, funeral rites, and rebelling in 19th century Brazil. And his most recent book that was just published in Portuguese, uh, but we hope that it will be out in English soon, is Ganhadores a Greve Negra de 1857 na Bahia, that I will not translate in English for you. Marcos de Carvalho uh, is a full professor also in the Department of History at the Univers Universidade Federal de Pernambuco in Northeast Brazil. And he has a PhD then from the University of um, Ur uh, Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, he is author also of several works on uh, slavery in Brazil and has been working in particular on the illegal slave trade from Africa to uh, from Africa to Brazil uh, in the 19th century. Uh, he's also a member of the, um, the editorial board of the Journal of Global Slavery. And Marcos is also a prolific historian uh, whose works I hope also will be uh, much more translated uh, into, into English. Now, the book that you are seeing here uh, then Alufa, um, that the original one, Alufa Rufino, or the story of Rufino, uh, won the, the literary uh, prize of Casa de las Americas in, in Cuba. Then it's a book that is uh, already an award um, uh, winning book. And uh, I hope that you have enjoyed reading the book. If you didn't read it yet, I hope that you are going to get the book and read it. And now I just leave the word <laughs> to, jo uh, to João. Uh, and after you are going to be free to ask your questions. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you, Ana. Thank you for, for you and uh, the other uh, hosts, hostesses in this, uh, uh, so so interesting and important uh, seminar you've been uh, organizing uh, during the, the pandemic. And uh, thank you also for the other people in the audience. I'm going to read a summary of the book uh, so I do not uh, exceed in uh, my time. And uh, I will also present uh, some of the uh, implications of uh, the historiographical implications of, uh, of, this, of the story that is told in this book. Well, the book narrates the life of a Yoruba Muslim named Rufino José Maria, also known as Abunkare. That was his Muslim name. Who was born in the kingdom of Oyo in present day Nigeria. 
at the turn of the, of the uh, 19th century. He was captured in Oshogbo, his uh, NATO land, a dependency of uh, the Oyo Kingdom, and was sold to African traffickers by Muslim Hausa warriors, probably a group of the Northern Oyo slaves who revolted in 1817 and sustained a campaign against the Oyo King in alliance with his Yoruba fools, particularly Afonja, the leader of the city of Ilorin. Rufino was probably sold to Brazilian slave traders in 1821 or 1822 in the uh, in port of Lagos, the most active enslaving port at the time in the West Coast, in the West Coast of Africa, West Africa. More precisely in the, in the uh, uh, Bight of Benin. Rufino spent eight years as a slave of an apothecary, a druggist, in the city of Salvador, capital of the province of Bahia in Brazil. His master trained him as a cook, but he also must have worked as a higher out street worker, maybe selling food that he himself prepared. As the slave of a druggist, he certainly learned how to prepare medicine besides delivering them to his master's clients. Rufino was later sold in the southernmost Brazilian province of Rio Grande do Sul by his young master, a cadet, a military cadet, who took him, who took Rufino, uh, to serve this cadet while in a war campaign in the late 1820s. After being sold, he had two masters in Rio Grande do Sul, the last one being the provincial, the, the provincial chief of police who was based in Porto Alegre, the provincial capital. Five years later, in 1835, in the midst of a separatist rebellion, a regional rebellion, Rufino bought his freedom with money he had saved as a higher out slave, both in Bahia and Porto Alegre. He may also have earned part of the money from making and selling Islamic amulet, amulets, for he was a literate Muslim. Once, once free, uh, he adopted the family name of his owner and he became Rufino José Maria, ex-slave slave of Rufino Maria, oh, sorry, ex-slaves or slave of José Maria de Sales Gameiro de Mendonça Peçanha, a, a very long name, uh, of course, that fits perfectly to a very important man, the police chief of uh, 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 an important uh, province. A couple of years later, after he received uh, his uh, manumission, Rufino moved to Rio de Janeiro, where he embarked as a cook on a slave ship bound to Luanda, for Luanda in Angola, the most active slave trade port in the South Atlantic. This was uh, sometime between 1838 and 1840. The transatlantic slave trade had been already abolished in Brazil since 1831, but it continued unabated due to official tolerance, in spite of a fierce, fierce repression by British cruisers, especially after 1839, when England issued the Equipment Act, which would allow the capture of uh, ships without human cargo on board, but equipped for the traffic, based on criteria established by the English in this particular law, uh, which uh, meant the presence on board of slave irons, slave deck, or planks used to build a slave deck, a large quantity of food, uh, a large number in uh, size 
and you know a large size of uh, pots and pans, water recipients, and so on. From Angola, instead of returning to Rio de Janeiro, Rufino made a few voyages, still working as a cook between Luanda and the northeastern province of Pernambuco. That was before he sh one of the ships in which he worked, actually the last one, apparently, uh, called Hermelinda, that was the name of his ship, which was captured by the British on, on the coast of Angola and taken to Sierra Leone in December 1841. In the British colony, the ship would face trial by the Anglo-Brazilian Mixed Commi Commission against the slave trade. While waiting for the court's decision about three months time, Rufino lived among Yoruba Muslims in Fura Bay, a place called Fura Bay, uh, in the outskirts of Freetown, where those uh, Yoruba Muslims were concentrated. There, he attended Quranic and Arabic classes. Due to disagreement between the British and the Brazilian commissioners, the fate of the Ermelinda was decided by a draw, literally heads and tails. And in a rare outcome for cases such as this one, the ship was considered bad prize and it returned to Pernambuco with Rufino on board again as a cook. After a few months in the city of Recife, Pernambuco's capital, Rufino returned to Sierra Leone as a witness in a court case started by his employers against the English government. In a court case, uh, uh, of course, a court case uh, uh, against the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, that disputed the unlawful capture of, uh, of the ship, of the Ernelina. However, uh, Rufino's testimony was never taken because the English refused systematically to even accept that the case go to trial or go on trial. While in Sierra Leone again, Rufino seized, seized the opportunity to attend classes with Muslim teachers for the next 17 months. So this time he had a longer sejour in, uh, in Sierra Leone. Uh, after that, he went back to, to Recife via Rio de Janeiro and Bahia, and that was 1844. And uh, he established, he finally established himself in Recife as a diviner and a healer, as well as a cleric, a Muslim cleric. Uh, in Yoruba, uh, Muslim clerics are called alufa, and that's how he was known uh, within the uh, uh, Muslim community, alufa rufino. In 1853, Rufino was arrested in Recife due to rumors of an, of an imminent slave revolt. He became a suspect because the police confiscated in his home a large number of manuscript books and uh, other writings, all in Arabic. The same kind of material that the police had found with Muslim rebels in Bahia close to 20 years previously, in 1835. We're talking about the, the famous Muslim uh, uh, slave uprising of 1835, about which I, I wrote and published in English a book called Slave Rebellion in Brazil that was mentioned by Anna. The last part of uh, the Rufino book, Besides presenting the place where Rufino uh, decided to settle in Brazil, that is the city of Recife, we cover his continuing connection, uh, connections with slave traders, the profile of the local African uh, population, and the political conflicts all around. So it's a very conflictive period in the province of uh, Pernambuco. 
uh, including a, a very, a very uh, serious liberal revolt, a popular revolt against uh, the census taking and uh, the uh, secularization of ecclesiastical uh, recordings. Uh, besides slave revolts, both real ones and imagined ones. In addition, in this last part of the book, we discuss, we, we, discuss, we, we again discuss the kind of Islam Rufino adhered to. Instead of the militant religion seen in Bahia in 1835, his religion was one that negotiated with the local culture, attending to the spiritual and other demands of clients, clients in all walks of life. Without uh, losing, however, its main doc doctrinaire message. Uh, Rufin was very keen at saying that he was uh, truly a deeply uh, devoted uh, Muslim, uh, Muslim when he was arrested in 1853, even saying that uh, he would be hanged before, uh, before uh, saying anything against his, uh, his religion. So besides swearing his allegiance to Islam, Rufino on the other hand, declared that his practice was not very different from specialists of Shango, which was the spirit possession religion of, of uh, uh, again, Yoruba or West African extraction in Recife. This same religion is called Candomblé elsewhere, elsewhere in Brazil, uh, especially in Bahia. The book closes with an impressive discussion in the pages of the Recife press between adepts of these two religions, Islam and Shango, uh, who uh, this, uh, this discussion was about who could profess their faiths free from police repression. They both alleged that uh, they had been allowed by the police chief to, uh, to profess their faiths uh, freely. During his interrogation in 1853, Rufino told most of the story that I summarized here for you, and which was used by us, the historians, as a guide to reconstruct the world in which he lived in oil, uh, as a free man under slavery and freedom in Brazil, at African ports of trade, on board slave ships, uh, during his uh, two sejours in uh, Sierra Leone, most of the Africa that we cover is actually uh, uh, Sierra Leone, and of course his life in Recife where he finally had settled. Rufino's life trajectory or itinerary is used as a lead to discuss slavery and the slave trade, African freed persons, and the resilience of ethnic and religious identities as seen through the experience of a truly Atlantic character. These interwoven aspects uh, have been rarely and so clearly dug, dug up from the archives. Of course, as is the rule in biographies of individuals such as this one, we lose traces of the man all the time in the archives, where he often becomes but a shadow, but he is replaced by people with whom he interacted, be it his different enslavers, and other enslaved Africans, his bosses and shipmates, his clients and co-religionists, police officers, and so on. The book shows the complexities of slavery and freedom in Brazil and of the slave trade on both shores of the Atlantic. Rufino was himself a petty slave trader 
who had once faced the middle passage as a prisoner in the hold of a slave ship. The crates of sweet balls that he took with him on board the Hermelinda was probably merchandise to be exchanged with at least one slave in Angola. However, he was no exception in Brazil, where many freed Africans and even slaves got involved in the slave trade. This is one aspect of the tragedy, tragedy of slavery that is not often discussed. Methodologically, the book could be defined as a social history of the slave trade written from a micro historical perspective, but linking the micro and the macro for the book tries to connect Rufino's life with wars in the Atlantic, in the African territory, slavery in Brazil, the business of, this, of slave trading in the, in the era of uh, illegality, illegality, British imperial maritime politics or policies, the social and political dynamics of the colony of Sierra Leone in the 1840s when uh, Rufino was there, resided there, the social and political dynamics uh, of, uh, of uh, sorry, sorry, the state formation in Brazil, including the many regional rebellions characteristic of this period, the circulation of Islam, this is uh, a very important point, the circulation of Islam in different places of the Atlantic uh, among other interconnected themes. Finally, the uh, readers who look for heavy theoretical statements and language in a history book will be disappointed because the story of Rufino was not written with the expert in mind, but for a general educated reader, although we believe it will also be of interest to specialists having all the proper apparatus of erudition, you know, footnotes and so on, and interpretive narrative that is required in a scholarly work. It addresses historical problems, concepts and methods that are in the center of academic discussions nowadays, such as ethnic and religious identity, creolization, African diaspora, Atlantic history, in, of course, the so-called biographical term. Thank you very much. I hope you have questions about it. Thank you so much, João. And now, if you have questions, there are uh, the, the best way is uh, to click on participants at the bottom of the screen and raise uh, your hand. Or you can just, okay, I already see two people here <laughs> with their hands raised. Then you just have to be patient with, patient with me. Let's see, uh, I have Alex Baruch and after Philip Warfield. Uh, okay, then Alex, you can just go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Okay. No, you are muted. <laughs> Thank you, Ana, and obrigado. Thank you, Professor Reyes and, and the other professors uh, that uh, wrote this book. I, I got this book first time 10 years ago when it went through the uh, Brazilian edition, and I'm super happy to see it here and to be able to use it with my own students here in, in the US. Regarding that jump from the uh, Brazilian edition to the uh, English edition uh, here. I wanted to ask um, any of the authors, um, what are the most important aspects in the, in the past five years or six years um, within the Brazilian historiography uh, in relationship to these networks of uh, Muslim practitioners or Muslim believers um, as the book shows on, in the case of Rufino, I, I agree that one, for me, the most surprising thing when I saw it 10 years ago, it was not just Rufino, which is an incredible story, 
but the networks of participants uh, that are some of them Muslim, some of them not, but of practitioners on this, not just there in Recife, but in other places uh, in, Bra uh, in Brazil, beyond the well-known event of the slave rebellion in uh, 1835. So what has changed since the uh, production of this book, the research of this book some 10 years ago in the case of Brazilian historiography in relation to this uh, subject? Okay, that's all. Can I answer? Yes, of course, go oh, ahead. I thought you were going to take other questions. Well, thank you, Alex, for your, for your question. Uh, good to see you again. After so many years, we saw these two aunts, uh, each other in uh, Emory, I believe. Um, now, it, it, it's, uh, well, the, the, the answer, uh, as far as I know, is that uh, um, no other studies have been done since the publication of the book. Uh, if you asked uh, since the publication of my Malay Rebellion book, uh, of course, uh, we have, for example, the publication of uh, that uh, incredible narrative or travel log uh, by Al Baghdadi, uh, which I also use, uh, uh, we also use in this, uh, in the Rufino book. Uh, and I already, actually, I already uh, used uh, not the Brazilian edition. Uh, but uh, previous, uh, previous uh, translation of this uh, incredible travel log uh, by uh, Ham al Baghdadi, uh, who is uh, actually his narrative is responsible for establishing precisely that uh, the, the Muslims in Brazil uh, uh, were not like islands in an archipelago without uh, connections, uh, communities uh, 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 that were not connected uh, one to each other, okay? Because this man uh, who uh, was uh, a priest on board, uh, 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 a Turkish uh, ship, he spent three years in Brazil and he preached. He was an imam actually. And he preached to slave communities in Rio de Janeiro, in Bahia, and in Recife. And so when, the, when he was uh, in, in, in Rio, uh, the people in uh, both in Bahia and in Recife, they uh, received the, the, uh, the news of his presence there and invited him to preach among, uh, among them, among the uh, uh, Muslims in, in Bahia and in, in Recife. And he traveled to these uh, other two, two cities, although he spent most of his, his time in, uh, in, in, in Rio. Besides that, we have uh, very clear uh, evidence, including uh, Arabic uh, books and loose papers and uh, arrests of Muslims in uh, Rio Grande do Sul, in Porto, both in Porto Alegre and in the city of Rio Grande, which is the coastal city the port city uh, or the Atlantic port city uh, in Rio Grande do Sul. Yeah? So we have uh, so far uh, news of three important Muslim communities, uh, urban communities, uh, you know, uh, better, better saying, uh, in, uh, in, in Brazil and, uh, in, in, in news that uh, they were interconnected, okay? There was a lot of uh, traffic, uh, slave traffic between Bahia and Rio de Janeiro and, Pernambu and uh, Rio Grande do Sul, as well as uh, not so much, but uh, 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 slaves were also sold from Bahia in, uh, in Pernambuco, okay? Besides uh, migration of uh, ex slaves, ex-African uh, slaves or ex-African uh, Muslim slaves who went to, you know, to Rio, to, to Recife and to Rio Grande do Sul or Porto Alegre. Uh, so uh, these people traveled, their papers probably also traveled. I'm talking about manuscript books, uh, you know, loose papers, amulets, 
and uh, it, it probably also uh, alufas, okay, uh, uh, malams or uh, Muslim clerics uh, who also traveled, just like Al Baghdadi traveled, uh, and uh, and so. Uh, maybe that should provoke uh, more research on these communities. But so far, since Rufino was published, that I know, I don't know if Marcus or, or Flavio have uh, read anything, I do not uh, have news of uh, substantial, let's put this way, substantial research on these. Flavio himself published, uh, but I, be, I believe it was before uh, Rufino a book with two other authors in which there is a chapter about uh, Muslims in late 19th century here. Okay, uh, not um, Muslims, Muslim, uh, African uh, Muslims, okay? Uh, actually, after abolition. I have now, uh, a project that I'm developing with the uh, Arabists, who, uh, which is to identify and, uh, and say something about the life of a man who owned a Quran that was published in 1867 in, uh, in Leipzig, in Germany. And I received this Quran from uh, descendants of, uh, of this man. And uh, there are some marks in this Quran and so on that is being uh, deciphered by uh, two Arabists, uh, friends of mine, one who is a Russian, the other one who is a, a German. And, uh, and I'm going to write the, you know, the story of, uh, of this man. They're going to try to decodify the markings that this man uh, did on this uh, Quran. So uh, that's what I basically could tell you about this, my friend. Thank, Thank you, João. Thank you, João. You have three more questions then, uh, and you keep uh, raising your hands. Now I have Ebony Davis, and I am unmuting you. And if I am not, <laughs> just do it yourself. Let's see if you can, okay. Still muted. Okay, now you are fine. Okay. Um, hi, thank you. I wouldn't say I really enjoyed the book. Um, I appreciate it. I think I, the story itself is is fascinating, but I really liked how um, I'm, I'm not Brazilian. So the way you kind of looked at Rufino through all of the different people in his life kind of weaved uh, or painted a picture rather of of the society that he was living in um, that is one that I am not familiar with. So that was really um, a, a fun kind of side note. And I guess I just wanted to know, um, seeing as though the first publication was 10 years ago and, and in Portuguese, what, how has the reception been different between that publication and this one? Um, I guess in both uh, spaces since it's now published in English. Um, and it's more particularly written for a general audience. So you, it's, it's not just kind of the same scholarly academy that's um, approaching this work. How, how, how has it been received? Okay, and let yeah. me just let me just add that Ebony she didn't introduce herself and uh, tell him that uh, Ebony she is a PhD student in the Department of History at Howard. Okay, great. You're in the right place. It's a great uh, school. Um, now, um, reception in Brazil was uh, usually uh, positive, although we did have a, a review in a major newspaper, the Folha de São Paulo. There was a mixture of, uh, you know, critique and, uh, and, uh, and a praise. Uh, it said, well, it was written by one of the leaders of the second slavery uh, movement uh, in Brazil, uh, a friend of, our, uh, of ours, a colleague of ours, who, who said that the book uh, should have more of second slavery uh, in it, okay? 
But since we do, we, we do not uh, write under this perspective, uh, of course, uh, it was, uh, he was unable to see the second slavery there, although all the symptoms of what they cause uh, second slavery was there. Like the dominance of the English in the seven seas of the world, it's there. And uh, like the internationalization of uh, the slave trading uh, operations, it's there. Uh, broad Atlantic history, but including Africa, which is not in the second slavery, you know, uh, efforts to rewrite uh, slavery, 19th century slavery, basically in, in the US, Cuba, and, and Brazil. So Africa is not, uh, you know, uh, has almost no place there, except when it comes to the uh, slave trade. Uh, but generally it was, you know, uh, we received praise, uh, praises and uh, it was the finalist of, uh, of, the, uh, of the National uh, Book Award in, uh, in, in Brazil. And uh, as, as it was said, uh, people in Cuba enjoyed it too. Uh, and uh, gave us a prize and uh, translated the book. The book is also available in, uh, in, in Spanish, published uh, in Cuba. As for reception in the US, I have no, I, I, have, I haven't seen any reviews yet. I have spoken to people who, uh, who have uh, adopted in class. Uh, so it was read uh, during the, uh, quarantine, or the, you know, the lockdown, and uh, and in the book they probably were able to travel uh, throughout the Atlantic. So maybe I I have been receiving good, uh, you know, good uh, good uh, uh, responses from students from. Uh, Students in uh, the University of Pennsylvania, for example, at Princeton, where two colleagues of mine uh, have adopted the book. But no reviews yet. I haven't seen any. If you, if you have uh, uh, read, any of you in the audience, uh, please uh, send it to Anna and uh, she'll send it to me. Thank you. Uh, Marcus, do you want to say something? I have to unmute you, Marcos. Você está mudo. Ok, unmute. Não quer falar nada? Ah. Marcos, tem que... Tem que... Ah, okay. Agora sim. Ah, no. Agora sim. Uh, I agree with João and also disagree with this perspective of second slavery in Brazil because it doesn't come to terms with the state that had most slaves in Brazil, which is Minas Gerais, but it's a, a, a slavery for the internal market. It has nothing to do with this. You know? And in addition to that, I mean, if you call that second slavery, then in, in Egypt, it's what what's there in Je Egypt. Uh, slavery is 0 0.1, 0 0.1, then in Mesopotamia, <laughs> and is slavery 0 0.2, then what's that slavery? or windows, you know? So I think this is, in Minas Gerais would be slavery 1.0, Brazil gold, no, whatever. So it doesn't make sense in Brazil, I think. And, they, and this guy is actually a friend of ours. We like him, but who is, I mean, who he's is trying he? to force uh, Rafael Marquez oh, from Uso. Rafael. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, he, he is everywhere. I mean, whatever you say, you have to put his second slavery model. And if you don't disagree or just doesn't want to use it, you know, I mean, it's a problem for him. And then he had access to this major newspaper, Folha de São Paulo, and he wrote this, well, these guys, they don't use second slavery. That was his critique. So what? I, João and, and Flávio were kind of mad at that. I left, you know, but I mean, this is, that's what John said. I agree with. Yeah, he, he was in his right, of course. Uh, we, uh, we did not become, uh, you know, enemies, not even adversaries because of that. Uh, Each one uh, has uh, his own perspective, and um, 
And there are lots of things in the slave, in the second slavery, uh, how to say, perspective that is uh, positive. Uh, like when they discuss historical capitalism, for example, it's uh, it's a revival actually of uh, a structuralist perspective that uh, uh, Marxist, you know, post-Marxist stuff. I like that too. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's uh, so Marxist, this is Marxist Marx. per perspective, which is nice, is yeah. interesting, is no, how without class struggle. That's all. <laughs> okay, we have uh, three more questions. Then Antonio Austin, I am unmuting you. Hopefully, yes, you are fine. I'm good. Um, however, um, Philip was actually before me. Oh, Philip. Okay, you are, we, we will always stay here until the end. Now, I'm following you. I have Philip and Ember, but it's just that the order there. Sorry, Philip. Okay, you, you allow Antonio to go first. He's mute. No, no, Antonio, go ahead. Okay, got you. Sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> so my name is Antonio Austin, and I'm also a first-year PhD student in the Department of History at Howard University. And so I noticed that um, in the prologue, you all talked about the fact that a lot of um, the Africans that were documented were more so via the police. Um, why did you all choose to, um, to highlight Rufino? Was there like a particular reason? Was it because you know his story was so great and there was a lot of documentation? Um, I'm just curious about what set him apart from other people. Uh, well, Want to answer that? Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Who Antonio. Answers? Antonio. Uh, I, I was looking for my uh, hearing device here. The a story like his is rarely found in uh, in the archives. Uh, because uh, here, here is uh, a man who was interrogated by the police in 1853, and uh, he tells his story, okay, from the time uh, when he was enslaved by uh, uh, another ethnic, uh, you know, members of another ethnic uh, group, but belonging to his uh, same uh, religion, uh, up until his uh, arrest in 1853. So it, it's a... Uh, uh, you know, uh, 30 years of his life that is described uh, uh, during this interrogation. If we had other uh, stories like his, uh, it would be fantastic. But uh, you write that he's not the only one. Uh, biographies of uh, this kind uh, has been written lately uh, everywhere in Brazil, actually. And in Bahia, in particular, we have a team of historians who are writing uh, trajectories, uh, individual trajectories of uh, usually of uh, Africans who were enslaved in Bahia and uh, managed to, to buy or to obtain somehow uh, uh, their, their freedom and uh, to prosper. Okay. One in that was not so much the case of Rufino because he did not become a rich ex-slave. But uh, many of the other uh, characters, they did become sometimes very rich uh, ex-slaves. And because of that, uh, those people, uh, they leave more traces in the archives because they become property owners including uh, owners of slaves. They are uh, registered in uh, ecclesiastical records as, for example, uh, as godmothers, godfathers. Uh, they, are, they are the ones who have uh, ignited uh, civil causes, uh, you know, in courts and uh, et cetera. So we, Rufino, the, uh, Rufino is special because of this, this Atlantic, uh, you know, uh, tour that he did going back and forth between, you know, Africa and Brazil, but others also did 
uh, others based uh, in Bahia also did. Uh, for example, just now a colleague of ours called uh, 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 Nicolau Pares uh, just finished a, a, a book uh, which is, has not been published about a very important uh, slave trader who was once uh, 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 a slave in, uh, in Bahia and became a, a very important uh, slave trader with connections not only with Bahia, but also with Havana. So he was in, at the time of the illegal trade, okay? And, and this man was, uh, was very powerful. Uh, in uh, in Agüe, where he to where he he returned uh, at one point uh, in his life after manumission. Also, uh, both uh, Nicolau and uh, and Lisa Castillo have written about the genealogies of ex high priestesses of Candomblé in Bahia. Uh, of famous candomblés uh, that uh, to this day exist, okay? Uh, this uh, possession spirit uh, religion. And uh, they have, uh, you know, shown uh, since the days of uh, their arrival here, their life uh, uh, as slaves, uh, manumission, uh, how they prospered as, uh, you know, uh, uh, businessmen and women and uh, several, most of them had owned slaves. And uh, I mean, that, that was the, the uh, how to say, uh, what people who prospered, prospered did in Brazil in the 19th century, okay? If you wanted to prosper, if you want to accumulate uh, property, you had to be a slave owner. And uh, Africans did that. Now, it's important, of course, to say that there was a very tiny portion of uh, enslaved Africans who were brought to Brazil, okay? They were uh, a very tiny uh, uh, proportion of slaves obtained their manumission. Most of them died as slaves or as enslaved people. Uh, and of those who obtained uh, their freedom, uh, very few managed to become a prosperous person in uh, in uh, in Brazil. Okay, so uh, but uh, I I have to admit that uh, Brazilian society was uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that it was exceptional, perhaps, but a very very uh, uh, peculiar things happened. Uh, especially in Bahia. For example, I have now uh, discovered uh, more than uh, 500 cases of slaves, enslaved people who bought their freedom by replacing themselves with another slave. So we're talking about a slave that went to the slave market and bought a slave or asked uh, someone, uh, a crew on, on a ship, a slave ship, to buy one on the coast uh, of Africa, and then use this slave to as a substitute. Okay, I haven't seen this phenomenon. I mean, I, you, you you find one or another examples elsewhere in the Americas, but in Bahia, only for fifty years, I found uh, over five hundred cases. So uh, some of them you can trace after they obtain their freedom, okay? But not with the details that uh, we find in other, you know, in other cases. So uh, uh, the archives uh, have to be very well tapped by, by historians. You have to know the archive. And, uh, and the archives uh, need to be well organized. And that's the case of the uh, Bahian uh, public archives, okay? In which you have a list, for example, of uh, probate records, of criminal records, of civil records by the name of the people involved, okay? Uh, and then you can just go there, find the name and, and, and go to the document. 
that facilitates a lot our our work. I hope I I answered your question. Thank you, João. Uh, I have now Philip <laughs> Ward. Are you not? Uh, uh, maybe maybe Max wants to say something. Okay, Marcus. No. No. no it's okay. Okay, you can just jump. You are unmuted. Then I will have Philip. And if you have anything else, just go ahead. Philip, you have to unmute yourself. And after I have Amber and then Jean. Okay, go ahead, Philip. Well, hello, Professor Reyes. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, my name is yeah. Philip Warfield. I am at Howard University, first year PhD uh, student in history. And I was really, really interested in how you... Um, make this whole social history. I really want to understand this connection here. So you also said that your work is the, the connection between micro and macro history. So how did you balance telling the social history and not a narrative strictly of Brazilian slave history? What do you choose to keep in? What do you choose to leave out? Can you help me be a little bit more clear about that? Sure. Uh, Philip, actually, our choice, uh, choice, our choices were uh, Rufino's choices, because he told us his story, and we just followed on his footsteps. So he was in Bahia. We went to Bahia archives, and he said that uh, he went to Rio Grande do Sul. We, you know, we looked for him in uh, in. Uh, Rio Grande do Sul, we only found, uh, you know, little about him there, but we found a lot about uh, his, his uh, master. Uh, then he said that uh, uh, he went to, to Rio and we didn't find anything about him, directly about him, but uh, we wrote about the, the, the city that received him uh, after he left uh, Rio Grande do Sul to go to, to, to Rio. And of course, we found a lot about his, uh, his ship, okay? The, the ship was uh, seized by the, uh, by the English and there was uh, an inventory of uh, everything on board, including Rufino's merchandise, for example. Um, and so, and, and, and the name of the, of, the, uh, of the person responsible for paying for this uh, voyage uh, who belonged to a very important uh, family uh, of slave traders in Recife. Uh, Marcus can say more about it. And then he spent uh, most of, uh, of his time uh, in this story in Africa. Most of his time he spent in this story in Sierra Leone. So we have uh, two and a half chapters only about uh, Sierra Leone, okay? Uh, which I particularly wrote those chapters and I found an incredible number of uh, uh, travel uh, records, uh, sorry, uh, travel uh, uh, logs, uh, uh, you know, people from England uh, mainly, but also from, from the US who visited Sierra Leone. And I zeroed in the, in terms of time, in the neighborhood uh, of uh, the time period uh, when uh, Rufino was there, okay? 1830s and 1840s. Uh, including an incredible, an incredible uh, 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 diary written by the, the wife of uh, the governor. So uh, this, uh, this macro history was given to us by Rufino himself, okay? It was impossible to write only about a micro, you know, trajectory. Actually, uh, uh, we did not find enough evidence about Rufino himself in the archives to allow for us to write a book very close to, he, to, to him. So we, we uh, filled in the, his story with the context, with people around him, with, uh, with ocean, with an ocean around him, okay? Uh, shipmates, captains, uh, uh, slave owners, uh, ship owners and uh, 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 missionaries in Sierra Leone, for example, uh, uh, 
uh, Anglican uh, missionaries and Muslims uh, also in, in Sierra Leone. Uh, here, pol police chiefs and police uh, uh, police officers, etc., etc., etc. So, uh, and of course, he he was. Everywhere he went, there was trouble. That's uh, that's very interesting because he was the victim of a war in uh, in uh, in Africa, and then when he arrived in Bahia, there was the War of Independence, and then he was taken to Rio Grande do Sul, where a war was going on there with his uh, his uh, uh, his uh, master was a cadet, uh, and uh, when he was uh, when he was manumitted in 1835, it was uh, the a, a, a very serious uh, federalist and separat separatist uh, rebellion had just started in Rio Grande do Sul. Then he went to, to, to Rio where the, uh, how to say, the uh, effects of the 1835 rebellion was still going on, a lot of repression against the African community, uh, 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 primarily against the community to which he belonged, which were the, the uh, Nago, or the Yoruba uh, community. Then uh, finally he settled in Recife where there were all kinds of rebellion as well. Okay, so, uh, you know, the, and this is macro history. He was, uh, you know, uh, when he was not a protagonist, he was at least a, a witness to all this world that was unfolding around him. Uh, so that's, uh, that's how the micro and the macro, you know, uh, uh, or the different scales of uh, of history uh, fit yeah. into this uh, story. Marcus, would you like to, to uh, join in? Yes. Uh, 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 regarding Rio de Janeiro, there we uh, we had some problems. For example, there was this rebellion in Pernambuco, uh, but the documents were not in Pernambuco. But it's said that the, the police chief said they, they had sent them to Rio de Janeiro. And then Flavio found the documents in Rio de Janeiro. This was kind of uh, interesting to find documents in different places and following him, as John said. Another uh, interesting thing is that we had a slave ship. We had a specific slave chef, ship with full of stories too. And they, they, there are many, many dramas inside a slave ship. All of these people, sailors, uh, uh, merchants, you know, uh, enslaved people, and, and the, the slave ship also kind of guided us. So, uh, I mean, and we, we, we were friends before. I, I, I don't, I'm not saying we agreed every time, actually, we always disagree, <laughs> which was great for the book because we we're always thinking and discussing. But uh, it's like João said, we're guided by Rufino and guided by a little bit less than by Rufino, of course, by this slave ship and all the dramas involved. Um, that's it, I mean, I agree with João. I, uh, I, I want to end a very important point. Uh, about archives. The first, the first uh, document that was found, uh, it was found in the Brazilian National Archive, archives in, in Rio de Janeiro. And it was, founded, it was found by Flavio, our third mm -hmm. author, who is not... Uh, you know, he's here. Oh, he's here, but he's not on the screen. Um, uh, but I am... Now he is, uh, he is oh, here. <laughs> and yeah. you are going to force him to speak even if you have to translate. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if, if, it if would be nice for Flavio to speak. If, if there is someone- Maybe Flavio could speak about that. Ne, uh, even if it's someone uh, who, uh, uh, I mean, uh, this book would never happen had not Flavio found this document. Let me explain what this document all, was all about, and, and then Flavio can uh, can join in. Uh, it was uh, a partial transcription of uh, of the inquiry of the police inquiry in 1853, in which Rufino's testimony was uh, transcribed. 
Okay, and then Flavio invited me because he, he knew about my interest with uh, Islamic history in, in Brazil. He invited me to write, uh, just write a, 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 an article. And then I said, well, since this guy was in Pernambuco, let's invite uh, Marcus to join us. And then we wrote uh, an article, okay? And then this article uh, evolved to a book. Flavio, please uh, say something about it. Okay, then Flavio, don't speak too fast. And uh, I will try to translate. If not, I will find someone here in the audience to help with the translation. It's too okay, much emotion. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Pode ir, pode falar. Bom, é, eu, eu, eu entendi alguma coisa, entendi uma parte da polêmica, das críticas, é, desse debate entre macro e micro-história, do impacto do livro, e agora a, a última fala do João. Real, realmente, é, a possibilidade de... Porque nós, nós fomos testando, tem uma, uma dimensão teórica no livro embutida, o que a gente foi testando um pouco das, das narrativas do Rufino e onde ele passou, e a gente foi localizando paulatinamente, a gente, é, a gente não tinha tudo já disponível, Quer dizer, teve algumas surpresas, né, do, como do Rufino ter entrado em conflito em Serra Leoa, no tráfico, que abriu mais outras portas para que a gente... Então, tem uma dimensão que eu acho que é interessante nesse livro, que é uma dimensão interna, teórica, de seguir esses caminhos e revelar, como o Marcos falou, os vários dramas pessoais, as várias expectativas desses de personagens como o Rufino e vários outros personagens que estão em várias dimensões atlânticas. Eu acho que a gente, de alguma maneira, a gente tentou elaborar esse livro também com uma dimensão teórica implícita aí de nos aproximarmos desse drama, de ver deslocamento, que é uma coisa interessante, desses africanos num lugar tão grande como o Atlântico, ao mesmo tempo o Brasil. E yeah, then uh, I don't know if someone uh, wants to add uh, to what Flavio is saying that he uh, followed the discussion uh, that we uh, he had up to now, and that one of the dimensions that he thinks that is the most important in the book uh, and the theoretical dimension is exactly following these uh, narrative threads uh, that uh, Rufino himself uh, gives to us uh, through his uh, displacements uh, and so on. I am not sure if I, <laughs> I certainly didn't uh, translate everything, but uh, this is essentially what he, he, he was bringing. And feel, uh, uh, fica à vontade, Flávio, para falar mais um pouco. E muitas das pessoas que estão aqui assistindo hoje também falam português e uh, vão ficar felizes de, de te ouvir. Okay, we have now Amber and then Jean. Uh, I will allow Amber then to go. Uh, Amber, you can uh, unmute yourself. Hello, um, my name is Amber Anderson and I am a first year master student at Howard. And um, my question is, um, what were some of the difficulties uh, writing this book? I know you guys, uh, it was three of you uh, who was writing it together. So I just wanted to know like, What kind of things did you guys face um, while trying to write it? And just overall, what, what were some of the difficulties? Okay, who wants to jump? In terms of the ah. as difficulties, difficulties. Well, uh, ah, I, can, I, can, I can, I can, I will start, okay? <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, one of the diff difficulties uh, was uh, the the, uh, the uh, deception, deception, deception of not being able to find him everywhere. He pointed us to go. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, we didn't find him uh, in this Fura Bay community in uh, in Sierra Leone. Fura Bay was, uh, you know, the place uh, in uh, the outskirts of uh, Freetown, where Mus uh, Muslims uh, from uh, uh, Yoruba Muslims uh, were concentrated, where they lived. They had their mosques, their mosque, one mosque, and 
and uh, where Rufino spent uh, all together almost two years. And uh, actually, I was plan planning to go to Sierra Leone, okay, to to work in uh, in uh, the archives there. But I uh, uh, that was the time of Ebola, and of course, between uh, you know Ebola and uh, in a complete research, uh, we chose uh, an incomplete research. Uh, I, I doubt very much that uh, we would be able to find the Rufino itself, uh, himself, I'm sorry, Rufino himself uh, in Sierra Leone or in the uh, CMS archives, okay? The uh, Christian Missionary Society's uh, archives. Uh, actually, these, are, these uh, uh, reports and so on, they are available and there was nothing about him specifically because of course he was not among them, among Christians. He was among uh, 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 Muslims, okay? And uh, there is no uh, written report uh, done by these uh, Muslims and, uh, that I know. And uh, the transcriptions of uh, the uh, court case against the Ermelinda I went to England myself and I did research in the British National Archives and I didn't find, uh, I, Rufin was there only because he had a quarrel with, uh, with a, a, a British Navy officer, okay? Uh, whom he called a dog, which is a typical uh, insult by a Muslim against a Christian. And um, so, uh, and in, in the published parliamentary papers, uh, documents, we also did not find uh, too much about him specifically, okay? Uh, so the biggest, the biggest challenge was uh, the absence of this, uh, of this uh, character. In many of the archives, we tried to locate him. Even in Bahia, for example, uh, I, I found here a lot about uh, his uh, master, but uh, nothing about him. I found about uh, his masters, his master, his master's family, uh, slaves or enslaved people in, in the, his master's uh, household, uh, you know, people who, had who was born, who died, uh, in the hands of this enslaver, but uh, Rufino was not there, all right? So had he not told us that uh, the name and the profession of his master, we would never uh, you know, find uh, this person or his, his master in, uh, in, 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 in Bahia. So a lot of indirect, uh, you know, uh, in, in Rio Grande do Sul, for example, the only document uh, directly related to Rufino was his manumission letter or his manumission paper, which was registered uh, with, the, uh, 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 with the notary, which as, as was, uh, you know, normal to do. Um, but we found a lot about his uh, master there, okay? The police chief that I mentioned in my presentation. And uh, I, 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 we probably also found him no longer in, uh, in Porto Alegre, but in this uh, other town, coastal town, by the name of Rio Grande, where a certain <laughs> José, a Muslim, was arrested and deported to, to, to Rio. Since his name was Rufino José Maria, there is a possibility that this José or José uh, was him. So uh, that, is, that was uh, you know, uh, the most uh, difficult uh, thing. Amongst us, as, uh, as Marcus said, we were friends and uh, we continue to be friends uh, during the production of this book. And uh, we, are, we are still friends, but uh, we fought a, lo a lot along the way. 
okay. Yeah. About things to include, things to extract, uh, you know, these kinds of things. Uh, I said, well, this chapter is too long. I mean, we are just, you know, distracting too much from our path and uh, things of this sort. Let's, you know, go back to his story and so on. But that's normal. Oh, uh, there, there... Go, Marcus, go ahead. Uh, uh... Yeah, that's what João said. We had a lot of disappointments. For example, he had this son. And he had a son that was a mother, maybe a family, because he went there. So, and we couldn't find him. So, uh, this rebellion he got involved in Pernambuco seemed to be, or, or a suspect, a big rebellion. And all the documents we had that really said something about it were the ones that Flavio found in Rio de Janeiro. And then he was involved, we suspected he was involved in this and that, but we couldn't find the real link. And there were times, João and Flavio remember very well, that we, we had to, to push back because we started to, since historians work, deal with possibilities. And there were times, I mean, are we doing history or literature? <laughs> we didn't know where to go, but uh, 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 this is it. I mean, we couldn't find all the, the documents we wanted, but then the context and, and what he told us uh, allowed us to, to talk about uh, Brazil, you know, and slavery in the Atlantic and all that. Uh, but it was difficult. and, and to do, I, I, I mean, the thing on, on, with the archives, the documents, I mean, that, that was a lot of suffering because we really wanted to find things we didn't, you know? And this is it, we, we couldn't even find uh, for sure if when he, we couldn't find when he died. Uh, there, there were times we suspected he was here and there, like for example, in this debate about Islam in Pernambuco, but, or this uh, situation. João just reminded us uh, that we didn't know for sure if that was him, but it was probably him. You know, <laughs> but that method in terms of methodology, that was complicated because there is this post-modern uh, narrative, you know, that mixes up everything, and we are not that kind of historians. In that sense, we are more traditional, you know, social history. We wanted the documents, you know. And this, we suffered a lot with that, a lot. Although there's a lot of imagination in this book too. Yeah. Oh, yes. So don't, uh, yes. don't be so positive. But based on documents, but so based on documents. To <laughs> uh, Flavio, Flavio, Flavio. Uh, uh, Flavio. Flavio. <laughs> no, uh, 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 a história do Rufino e as possibilidades da documentação são muito mais fantásticas e imaginativas do que qualquer tentativa de fazer literatura. Se a gente tivesse feito só literatura, não teria feito, não conseguido imaginar nem a metade das coisas que os documentos que nós encontramos e ajudar a gente a localizar mais documentos fizeram. E o Rufino ajudou, porque ele ele simplesmente ele é um personagem que colaborou muito. Ele Onde ele, onde ele passou, ele deixou é, rastros. Quer dizer, a gente estava quase, em alguns momentos, a gente estava quase perdendo ele como personagem e ele dava alguns acenos para que a gente continuasse não só a localizar ele no documento, como fazer mais perguntas a novos documentos e mais materiais que a gente ia, na verdade, tentando localizar. Então, a história, a história dele já tem muita, muita imaginação do que qualquer tentativa de... Ficcionalizar. É, yeah, ficcionalizar, the, exatamente. What Flavio is saying that um, what they did with this book and what they found in terms of the trajectory of uh, Rufino, uh, if they were doing literature, they would not be able to imagine all these stories and all, the, all his trajectory. Uh, then uh, Rufino himself would uh, be showing them uh, where to go and uh, uh, asking them questions about what uh, they were doing. 
Thank you so much. You have uh, Jean now, and I just want to, to, to invite you to take a look also at the chat uh, for the Marcos, uh, João, and uh, Flavio. We have here uh, Susan uh, Ferber from uh, Oxford University Press, who is your editor, and mm. she's very happy uh, to be able to see you on the screen for the, the first time. We have also two questions on the chat, but I will take first uh, Jean Ebrard, and then we move to some of the questions from the, the chat. Uh, Jean, you can go ahead. I am unmuting you. Oh, okay. Together. Yes, <laughs> it's done. here we are. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I thank you guys for this uh, beautiful presentation of your book. Uh, my, my question, come back a little on the, on the question of Antonio and Philip. Uh, 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 perhaps I will, uh, I will say that in another way. Uh, in your precedent book, be all the three, uh, you, were, you were not uh, writing history completely abstractly. You had a lot of character were uh, discussing in your book, were uh, present in your book. I, I just give an example on one of the books published in English, which is Slave Rebellion. All the discussion of the inconfidence of Bayana, the, the, the way in which uh, the, 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 the plot was discovered, uh, it's, it's a fantastic discussion around characters, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and so, uh, my, my feeling is that when you do, you were doing that, we were doing that in books in the past, we were uh, introducing by this discussion between characters some complexity. Uh -huh. uh, and particularly uh, in the, one of the complexity, which is frequently present in many, many books on slavery in Brazil, is uh, um, the, co the cohesion of the, of the community of slaves. Uh, are, they, are, are they working together or not? What's, what are the conflict between them and so on and so on. So when you choose to, to work on one character only and to focus on, on one guy and to write a biography, uh, my question is, do you lost or do you win something in comparison with what you were doing before? Because when, when you choose to write on one guy, uh, of course, you write on this guy because you have sufficiently a uh, document on him or her, and, uh, and you write on, on this person because, because uh, the archives conserve their document. And very frequently, they are bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> slave return uh, uh, traders uh, uh, and so on and so on, you know. And why they are bad guys? Because it's most frequently what the archives conserves of yeah. the life of uh, ordinary people. Uh, so what you win, what you lost, going to this sort of portrait. And uh, are you going to continue to write portraits or not? Okay, thank, uh, thank you, Jean. Who is going? For me to so, spotlight the video? <laughs> let's start with uh, one of the other authors now, okay? I have something to say about it too. <laughs> no, João, go, go ahead. I think it's you well, who had to well, answer. Uh, uh, Flavio, do you want to, to go first? No, no. Okay, uh, Jean. I think uh, you're right in the sense that uh, we lose a lot because uh, uh, after all, we are following one specific history, okay? I mean, one specific uh, itinerary, individual itinerary. And if we are going to write uh, a, a, a general, a general uh, work about, say, the legal uh, period or the legal uh, slave trade period, uh, the story would be uh, different, would be wider, uh, with uh, a plethora of uh, you know, new characters, but without any one of them uh, taking the front stage, as in this case, uh, uh, 
is inevitable, of course. What we win is, uh, I think that uh, we humanize, uh, you know, the, 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 this, this, uh, this history, okay? The history of the Atlantic, uh, of the slave trade, of slavery, even if it is through the eyes or the actions of the bad guys. Uh, because uh, the bad guys uh, will, will be a contrast to what's happening uh, in terms of oppression, of uh, exploitation, in terms of the terror, there was the slave trade and uh, slavery. So uh, to say that it was, uh, uh, th that uh, it, uh, it's a more human perspective, it's not to say that it was a humanitarian perspective, okay? Uh, it is terribly human, let's put it this way. And, uh, and so I think that uh, we win in the sense that uh, by reading through, uh, you know, this world through a biography, we can see, uh, I, I think we can uh, establish an emotional connection more a, a more a closer emotional connection than uh, when uh, you write in more abstract uh, terms. Uh, in terms of uh, writing about uh, biographies in general, actually, I'm I'm writing my third biography now of uh, again a bad guy, uh, an ex uh, African uh, slave who. When he died, he owned uh, almost 30 slaves, for example, uh, besides a property, you know, uh, real estate property and so on. But the other books that I wrote, for example, the uh, Slave uh, Rebellion book, the Death is a Festival book, which is also a about a popular revolt. And my latest book, uh, which is only available in Portuguese, uh, which is about a strike, an African strike uh, by street workers, African street workers in Salvador, Bahia in 1857. Uh, you, wh what I'm writing about is a biography of uh, an event. So uh, I take an event and I surround it with all the characters, context, uh, processes, uh, uh, economic, social, cultural, etc., implications. Uh, but the event is always there, okay, to be explained and to explain what is uh, surrounding it. And I think that's the same uh, method, if you will, that uh, we use in uh, biography as a historian. Because the professional biographers, they have uh, other, other, another way of approaching the, uh, you know, their figures, their characters. But as a professional historians, we we need to, you know, to write uh, with uh, contextualization all the time. Otherwise, otherwise we will, we will lose the meaning of that particular life. Huh? Well, you 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 and Rebecca wrote, uh, you know. Uh, the way the biography of uh, the Tronchin family, uh, and uh, you know, we did all the same this. thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's what I had to say about this, uh, Marcus and Flavio. No, Flavio. No, eu eu queria eu 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 não sei se estou entendendo todo todo o debate e não quero tirar o assunto. Mas, dentro dessas questões, eu queria lembrar que alguns silêncios na trajetória do Rufino, do silêncio no sentido do que a gente nós encontramos documentos sobre ele, são extremamente sugestivos dessas percepções que ele pode ter tido em diferentes contextos. Eu poderia citar dois, quer dizer, a saída dele de Salvador e o que ele vai encontrar na comunidade na Go, no Rio Grande do Sul, e quando ele fica liberto e chega no Rio de Janeiro, num momento de muita repressão no Rio de Janeiro, depois da revolta dos malês. São profundos silêncios, mas que ajudaria a pensar, por exemplo, os impactos mentais na vida de um africano 
é, se movimentando, por exemplo, em lugares com determinados impactos. Ele vai sair do Rio Grande do Sul, ele vai embora do Rio Grande do Sul quando eclode a revolta separatista, a farroupilha. Né? E vai estar chegando no Rio de Janeiro ainda dentro do ano de 35 com muita repressão ainda no Rio de Janeiro. Quer dizer, ele poderia ter ficado no Rio né? e aí a decisão que faz com que ele... Ou seja, esses silêncios são também espaços para que a gente é, não colocar ficção no, no lugar, mas imaginar esses dramas né? pessoais, é, esses dramas pessoais que envolviam a vida de um africano nessa dimensão atlântica que a gente quis chamar. Né? And, uh, what Flavio uh, is saying here is um, that some of the silences regarding the trajectory of Rufino um, are very suggestive. Uh, and he identified two moments here that are uh, very important. Uh, the, the first one is when he leaves Salvador in Bahia to go to Rio Grande do Sul. And there in Rio Grande do Sul, then the kind of contact uh, he can have uh, with uh, the Nago Yoruba speaking community. Uh, also the fact that when he leaves Rio Grande do Sul, it's the moment of the the separatist rebellion, the Revolução Farroupilha. And then he goes to Rio de Janeiro exactly at the moment of the aftermath of the, um, of the Malay rebellion, when uh, there is a lot of repression against uh, African-born uh, individuals, either enslaved people or, or uh, freed. Then he says that the silences are, um, are important also to, to, to guide the, the work they did. Now, uh, folks, uh, we have a question from Stuart Schwartz. Then, Stuart, I don't know where you are. I'm trying to find your video here. I ask you to unmute yourself. And then I just... Here I am. Oh, here it is. Yes, go ahead. Um, I thought... Uh, the that Jean brought made a very uh, interesting and important comment that uh, I was thinking the same thing. Uh, I, I admit well, that I, I'm writing a review of the book for the Hispanic American Historical Review. And I was given permission to do so even though you and I have a, a relationship uh, that usually excludes me from re reviewing a book that you wrote. Uh, but uh, Tatiana Sejas was the uh, Hispanic American editor uh, uh, and who was here tonight with you uh, uh, is allowing me to do it. Uh, after reading the book, I thought that the genius of the book is the way in which you were able to take the few occasions where Rufino appears in the, in the documentary record and to tie those occasions together the story of Brazil in the 19th century. I think it's one of the few books that's able to do that. It's a book that's for specialists, but it's a book I can give to an undergraduate student and say, you want to know what Brazil was like in the 19th century? This book will tell you. And it tells you in, in ways that you often don't find in books. I, I said to another student, this is like Leslie Bethel with people. <laughs> This is, uh, you know, it's a book about the, the period of the making of the illegal, the slave trade, and then how people reacted, how people who were involved in, in Brazil and in the trade were impacted by the legislation and the laws and, and the negotiations that took place. And so I think that the real genius of the book is, is that it goes beyond what any individual biography could do. And I think the, uh, that you, the three authors, are really responsible uh, for, for making this book. Rufino gives you a lot, but you have added a lot to his story and have made this book the book that it is. And I really think you should be congratulated. I'm going to say that in my review when I finally <laughs> write it. Thank, Thank, you, Thank you, Stuart. You. Well, what can I say? <laughs> 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 For those who do not know, because there are some uh, young people in the audience, Stuart Schwartz uh, was uh, the dissertation advisor of uh, João José Reis. Then you see that there are nice advisors out there. Not yeah. all the, the <laughs> not all of them are bad people. Some are good. 
become fr and, and they become friends because uh, we have you know kept being friends uh, for how many years now? Forty years? Over Six forty, I think. Well. Don't don't reveal oh the age. Yeah, yeah, better not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have one question here from the chat. Uh, Cristiana Bastos, uh, she uh, left, uh, she is in Portugal, and she's saying, Obrigada por esse encontro, que privilégio todos os autores juntos discutindo os detalhes da pesquisa. Terei de ir embora antes do final, mas deixo meu agradecimento. Um alô especial para o Flávio, há quanto tempo? Okay, and you have one question here from Ayla Eman. I don't know if she or I think that is she, if she is still around. Uh, if not, I am sorry that I am calling you she if you are a he. But in any case, uh, this is the comment. Thank you for this wonderful discussion. I was so glad to see this work in English. I researched the enslaved African Muslims who were forcibly migrated to what is today the United States and have found that Americans are constantly surprised about the history of Islam in this country, about Black Islam and its long history, and the fact that an enslaved Muslim is left behind, respectively, so much material culture. Then the question, do you find the same shock in Brazilians about the history of Black Islam in the country, or is it more widely understood and taught in schools? Uh, how did uh, this affect how you told Rufino's story. Can I start? Okay. Yes, yes, go ahead. Well, um, actually, the African Islam practically disappeared with the last uh, African born Muslims uh, at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, the Islam was not able to convert the second generation of uh, African Brazilians or Afro-African uh, descendants. There was one, one, uh, one report that uh, most children of uh, Muslim men followed uh, his, or, uh, uh, his or her uh, mother's religion, which was usually not um, Islam. Could be Catholic, could be uh, Candomblé, the religion of, of uh, spirit possession, and so on. So although you, you still have a tradition of the presence of uh, Muslims in black families in Bahia, uh, the presence of, uh, of ancestors, enslaved ancestors who came to Bahia and were Muslims, these families, they are not uh, uh, Muslim families any longer. They praise their ancestors and so on, but they are not uh, Muslim. Most of them actually that I know, they are either Catholic, Catholics, or they are candomblé uh, devotees, or both, because that's a possibility in Brazil. To be, uh, you know, uh, uh, have a double, as we call it, double militancy in the religious uh, terms. Now, uh, what is interesting is that uh, African Islam have come back in the last uh, 20 years with missionaries from the same zone, the same area in Africa, uh, where the historical African Muslims came from, that is Nigeria, and specifically Yoruba land in Nigeria. We have uh, 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 an imam here who oversees our only uh, uh, mosque, in Salvador, Bahia, uh, who was, by the way, educated in, uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, but he's from Nigeria and he's Yoruba, okay? And uh, a very, a very uh, knowledgeable and, uh, and, and uh, uh, 
you know, interesting, nice person. Uh, I know him personally. We have uh, participated in many events uh, celebrating the Malay Rebellion of 1835. But it is interesting that, uh, you know, uh, Islam is being reintroduced by the same guys who were rebelling in 1835. I mean, the same, uh, you know, people from the same, uh, from the same area. Now, uh, there is, uh, there are Muslims who, of course, in Brazil are very interested in uh, 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 the history of Muslims in, 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 uh, in Brazil, and particularly of, uh, African Muslims, although in the majority they are not, you know, black people, some are, but who who have embraced uh, this uh, knowledge of the uh, of the Muslims, particularly because of uh, the resistance that it uh, you know meant in uh, 1835. So a lot of these. Uh, of these uh, uh, Muslims, they, uh, they belong that uh, the rebellion was a continuation of the jihad, okay? And talking about continuation of wars in Africa in the new world, we have been talking about it since the turn of the 20th century, because uh, since then, uh, scholars in Brazil uh, were talking about the continuation of the jihad in Brazilian soil. And going to you know to to Africa to understand the uh, slave rebellion uh, rebellions because uh, you know there were multiple rebellions in the first half of the 19th century in Bahia, in particularly the 1835 uh, uh, rebellion. And so uh, and so we do have this, and uh, we are also have a, more, a lot of memorializing. Of this, of this past, primarily uh, within the black movement. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, here in Bahia, the carnival mm -hmm. identity groups, they have celebrated uh, in, in different, uh, I mean, different carnival groups. They have celebrated the, the, uh, the Muslim rebellion of 1835 several times, okay? Black feminists uh, are keen in identifying uh, a leader, a, a female leader in the 1835 rebellion, although there is no evidence that that uh, was the case, but they do, a woman by the name of uh, Luisa Marin, who, by the way, uh, is the mother, was the mother of the, our most famous uh, uh, black abolitionist and poet, Luis Gama. And, uh, and so there is a lot of, and there is a, an, an effort here in Bahia to even, to memorialize even more the Malays. For example, there is a street called the Malay Revolution in Bahia, okay? And uh, we are trying to, to call the uh, metro or the subway station that uh, is located in the place where the, 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 the uh, uh, five rebels who were shot to death um, after the rebellion. We are trying to call it the, the, the Muslim, the, the African Muslim uh, station, the Malay station. And uh, so we, uh, there is this kind of, uh, you know, memorialization of, uh, of Muslims here, but uh, which has no, I have to say, uh, important repercussion in terms of uh, converting people to Islam. Although Brazilians uh, uh, enjoy religions a lot, they uh, are not running to, uh, you know, to Islam. Okay, they are running into ev evangelical churches primarily. Okay, they uh, embrace Candomblé. Uh, Catholicism is still the, uh, the most important religion in Brazil, but Islam is not even a, you know, a, a distant competitor to all these uh, religions. Maybe because of its, uh, you know, its strictures in terms of behavior, maybe or because uh, some, uh, you know, the, the more restrict uh, behavior that it, uh, preaches uh, uh, towards uh, women. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we need to do 
uh, research uh, on that. Thank you, João. Uh, I don't know if Flav and Marcos want to add something. Uh, we are 10 minutes uh, to the end. Then if some of you, you have still questions, you can have one more question. And I think that Flav wants to, to, to say something. Flav, pode ir. Não, eu, eu, eu não tenho mais questões para colocar. Ok, uh, não quer fazer um comentário também? Ok, tá. Uh, tinha a impressão que tinha te visto levantar não, a mão, não, Marcos? Não, não. Marcos? Também não? não. Uh, any other questions? Your last chance. No other questions? Then I will just, uh, okay, let me just make sure that I'm not seeing any questions here. Then, folks, I just want to Thank you all for being here today. And if by any chance you didn't get the book, then this is the book that you are discussing today, the story of Rufino. You can get it uh, online uh, on Amazon and so on, uh, Oxford University Press. And I just want to call your attention that you are going to have this kind of meeting then uh, in November, December, and it's still next year. Several of the future presenters are uh, among us. If you want to see the entire calendar, uh, go to uh, www.slaveryarchive.wordpress.com. Uh, you can see then where to register for the specific um, sessions. And also, of course, see the YouTube um, link. Our next session is November 11, that is a Wednesday, and you are going to discuss the book by Erin uh, Rowe, Black Saints in Early Modern Glo Global Catholicism. I think that in the United States, this is a Wednesday, 5 p.m., and this is the, um, the um, Veterans Day. And then I have my own book that you are going to discuss on November 18, then the book was uh, was just pub it, it will be published tomorrow. Then okay. I hope that you you can come uh, attend the next meetings. It was really a great pleasure to be with all of you. I thank uh, João, Marcos, and Flavio for accepting uh, during the session during these difficult times that you were uh, in. Uh, it's uh, it warms uh, my heart to be able to to be among you and to discuss this beautiful book. Uh, my students in my my uh, graduate seminar, they reviewed the book. If they allow, I can always send uh, the reviews to, to you. Uh, otherwise, I hope that we stay healthy and safe and uh, take care and go vote for those who can vote in the United States and those uh, who can vote in Brazil for the municipal elections. Uh, do the same. Uh, otherwise, stay safe and healthy. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Anna, and congratulations. Thank you, everyone, and congratulations for the new book. Okay, then let me just let me just highlight the the authors. Then João, thank you so much. Flavio, thank you so much. Obrigado. And thank also, you. Uh, thank you, Marcos, Marcos, thank you so much. And thank again, much. let let me highlight also Vanessa for my co-host. And I don't know where Alex is. Oh, he's there. Then let me just highlight him. Uh, this is our team who are leading this initiative uh, uh, every, every two weeks, almost by now. Thank you so much, folks. Then stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye.